of Ian Dogfin down the street hired me and he said to me, your job is really deliver, deliver, deliver. This was his <laughs> task. And I think we have delivered. Um, you know, this year we have crossed the one billion unique children that have been vaccinated by Gavi, but that's only one statistics. 1 1.4 billion have um, uh, received vaccines as part of campaigns, 1.9 billion in terms of, of, of COVAX. Um, and I, I think for me, the most important statistic is that we've seen a 70% reduction in vaccine preventable diseases, which has contributed to a 50% reduction in under five child mortality, which is the statistic we usually use to talk about development. So I think it has been a very, very powerful um, you know, effort. But I want to put one more statistic at the beginning on the table, because I think in some sense for this conversation, it's the most important. As you know, during the pandemic, um, the routine vaccination numbers dropped. It was 30 to 40 percent March and April of 2020. It then it finished in 2020 with about a 4% drop. So the numbers had started to come back up, talking about a resilient health system. And we thought in 21 that we would get all the way back up, but Delta occurred, Omicron occurred, more shutdowns. And so we had another 1% drop. So net net was about 5% drop, which is terrible given the importance of the systems. But the systems that were built delivered three times the number of vaccines in 2021. This is an extraordinary statistic because it wasn't outside systems, it was country mm. systems doing this, and it showed how resilient those systems really were. It wasn't without cost. Everywhere in the world we had health workers that mm. you know, had, had a terrible burden and people burned out and were tired, but what it showed is we had built a system that really mm. was resilient. We've gone from 59% coverage with our tracer vaccines up to you know, over 80% at the peak. Again, there's been a drop. Um, and 90% of people have access to at least one dose of routine vaccine. Mm. So this mm. is the most widely distributed mm. health intervention. And mm. as I said, vaccines don't deliver themselves. So what we've seen is this incredible building of health systems. Mm. Thank you. And we will definitely have more time to discuss that and, and the learnings uh, and, and what we can take from that experience as well. But I would also like to take this opportunity, Seth, to ask you if you could also put forward some of the challenges that you are seeing now and on the road ahead. And could you also uh, uh, pose a challenge to Norway as a donor uh, country uh, when it comes to the road ahead for global health? So, I mean, I think the biggest challenge now, we are entering a period of, of pan-epidemics. Um, if you look at increasing population, if you look at um, the effects of climate change and mm. migration, um, we are going to see more and more outbreaks, and we're seeing it now, um, you know, with the largest number of cholera cases, outbreaks of hemorrhagic fevers and, and um, polio, all these different diseases. And so we, we as a world have to be prepared for that. And the world has been panic, neglect, panic, neglect, and panic, neglect, and I thought, this time, a $12 trillion cost of a pandemic behind us that people would have a longer memory and might say, yes, we, we need to think about the whole world. We have to help prepare. Um, and I see signs of neglect occurring again. Mm. So I think the greatest challenge is in a world with poly crises is we can't go from crises to crises to crises. We need to deal with crises multiple crises at the same time. And if we now pull away from global health because we have to deal with Ukraine or we have to deal with earthquakes or we have to deal with climate change, you know, we will invariably see further degradation of society and, 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 and increases in poverty, et cetera, because at the end, health is critical. When you have it, it's not a big deal. But when you don't have it, you know, in a sense, nothing else matters. So, I think for Norway, which has been an incredible supporter in global health, an incredible supporter to Gavi, I think the really critical issue is, is can we stick with it as we deal with challenge after challenge moving forward? I mean, that's what we've been asked at Gavi to do is mm. deliver, 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 and, but we need our partners to stick with us to help do that. And, mm. and there is a challenge now because all of a sudden, with the pandemic, everybody's an expert in, in pandemics, but we need to return back to who's able to deliver and, and, and what does it mean going forward. Thank you, Seth. 
I will ask, uh, turn to you now, Annette. Um, could you also give us, share with us uh, some of your reflections on, on the role of Gavi as, as a close partner uh, for Norway's investments in global health uh, in the past decade? And, and also maybe if you could say a little bit about um, the role of multilateral organizations and funds and mechanisms vis-a-vis -vis the national uh, institutions and the national actors uh, uh, yeah, uh, at those the in yeah the two uh, the two different levels and uh, the interaction of those two thank you thank you lisa and um i'll try i'm not <laughs> sure if i can address all that <laughs> uh, and, and thank you so much uh, Seth. i think you really luckily pointed to some areas where we wholeheartedly agree and I think I just to repeat that global health is a key priority to Norway and it has been through many, many different governments. So it's sort of a stable that we can keep, but it is changing. Uh, one of the things that has been changing is that Gavi uh, support to Gavi. And we were one of the founding donors. We are still and I hope and think we shall be still one of the largest donors also in the future. And Going a little bit back, uh, Gavi was one of the uh, one of the uh, mechanisms funds that was established to really give some strength to the Millennium Development Goals, and I think at that time it was perfectly right to have a very focused effort, and uh, it was very important. It delivered uh, fantastic results. Just pointing at childhood vaccination. It's probably one of the most cost-effective health interventions that exist. And Gavi, together with countries, WHO, UNICEF, others played a key role and impressive results. And you mentioned some of them. And it was a truly astonishing progress. And when I saw this and I thought, OK, then we could have said, and the rest is history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everything went well. But then COVID happened. And I think it's good that you sort of draw that. All the other things, really important. But that is a, there's a lesson here. Uh, I would like to really commend you. Gavi was able to deliver on its core mandate while adapting to this enormous new challenge. And I remember, I'm sure many of you remember, the launch of COVAX. That was one of the first Zoom meetings or something, so we <laughs> all were struggling a bit with that. But it was a really big moment when I think you announced the establishment of COVAX. And I would say I am very proud that Norway was one of the first countries to pledge to the COVAX AMC. And it was brave, I think. But looking with hindsight, in total, the global response and efforts by states, it failed in many aspects, not least regarding the efficient and committed cooperation. Gavi stepped up. But I think there is a lesson to be learned for states in this. Going from this MDG period, the focus to really, yeah, I think what you call it, the vertical fund thinking, and to the SDGs, the support for global health has only made more and not less sense for Norway. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the reasons for this, if I could just find this, I'll find the reasons on page two, um, that health reduces inequalities. It's a human right. Healthy populations is a good investment. It promotes social and economic development. All these are key to achieve the sustainable development goals. Going a little bit back to vaccines, it's an enormously costly business, I can tell from uh, <laughs> dealing with the budgets. But I think, as you alluded to, it is so much more costly to not have them. And the IMF number, $12.5 trillion for financial loss during COVID, not to even mention the human and social loss. So there is no alternative. Also, like to use this opportunity to commend Gavi for the new vaccines and the role of Gavi as a market shaper has been an innovation which single countries we could not do this alone. So that is an incredibly important role. And despite all the donor efforts, still the multilateral mechanisms for health is only a smaller part of the picture. And I think we are painfully aware of this, but therein also lies a roadmap ahead. The domestic investment is the biggest source and it must be increased and sustained. And we also think there is a very important link between our global health efforts to work for financing, for development, national resource mobilization, tax reforms, anti-corruption, increased financial transparency, 
is very important also for securing access to health for all. So to see these things together, I think, in all policies is, is also an angle. We also think there is one important lesson, looking back, uh, that the time for the silos is over. And we must avoid fragmentation at country level. And we are very happy that Gavi and other international partners do support not to fragment health systems, but to really make it all come together. And you, you talked about the increased uh, the efforts you do and, and the results regarding uh, the, the strengthening of, of the health systems at country mm -hmm. level. So I think that was just some things and the partnership, again, Gavi's role in all of this, directly, indirectly, extremely important to Norway. Thank you, Annette. Before I give the word to Camilla and Ora, I would just like to ask you um, another question, Seth, on, on, uh, to build on what Annette said now also and, and what you previously said about the possible integration of health system strengthening and more um, uh, yeah, immunization programs. Um, how do you think we can balance these? You touched upon it already, but what is the best model for balancing these two diff uh, different approaches and interventions? Uh, or should uh, an organization like Gavi uh, focus on the core business? Mm. Or, you know, how should there be more integration? What is your sort of very brief take on that. So, so first of all, um, if, if one is to say we're just supporting health systems, I mean, health systems, to your point, mm -hmm. need to be domestically supported. We can help. We can put some um, finance in. We can provide some technical assistance. But this is the core to what the health budgets of countries are. And we want to get them moving in the right direction. But we cannot replace that. But if we were to say, OK, just focus on vaccines, you know, here, you have your vaccines there. Vaccines don't deliver themselves. And this is the critical piece. So it was interesting in, in the COVAX time and, you know, whether, you know, pieces of it failed, it's a strong word or not. I mean, the previous pandemic um, of swine flu, zero doses got to developing countries and used. And this time, the first doses came in 39 days. Within a few months, we had 100 countries that received doses. There was no question. There was slowdowns. There was export bans. There were enormous problems. But today, the coverage rate for primary vaccination in um, developing countries, the 92 poorest countries, half of the world's population is 54 percent versus 65 percent globally. And if you look at the age distribution in those two populations, that's probably about the right ratio. It's not it's not perfectly equitably, but the, the point is that that was using those health systems. Now, of course, we had put in 65,000 new cold chain points in developing countries during the period before COVID. When COVID occurred, you use those systems. Now, we had to, because we ultimately had mRNA vaccines, we had to build ultra cold chains. So we had to add to it. We had to put different things in. But the point is, it's that investment in systems that sit there and that are used by countries that are what you know really makes a difference. So I think we, we really have to not separate these two things. Everything is about strengthening the health systems. And the last thing I'd say is that the difference for what we do and many others do is that we look at universality. You don't go to a country and say, okay, we're going to introduce a new vaccine, but we're only going to give it to this part of the country and not that part of the country. I mean, we do if there's an outbreak of a disease maybe, but in general, we provide 100% support. That's not true for other interventions. And so the critical issue for us is to reach those zero-dose children to try to extend that system out to the absolute last mile. And of course, that woman health worker, and they usually are women, that is who will provide services for other areas in health and, and beyond nutrition and other areas once those systems are built. So for us, it's this head down, focused goal on getting those vaccines out there, measurable. We know where we're not succeeding. We have about 9, 10% of populations that are zero dose that are not receiving. And that's where 50% of the under five mortalities occurring and two thirds are below the poverty line. So let's work on trying to bring those people into the health system. I think that's the most powerful thing we can do. Hmm. 
Great, thank you, Seth. Moving on to you, Camilla. Uh, the Norwegian Institute of Public uh, Health uh, do you have uh, quite a few collaborations with uh, uh, several national public health in institutes, uh, some in very uh, challenging contexts, such as Malawi, Palestine. Could you please reflect on the role of these institutional collaborations uh, for health system strengthening in countries, uh, as well as when, uh, for health uh, security. Thank you. So we, we, can you hear me? Or have I turned it off? No. I think it's on. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's where the... It's difficult oh, when you have a lot long thank hair. <laughs> thank you very much for <laughs> inviting me here and also for <coughs> raising, raising the discussion, the, the old discussion about the vertical and mm. the horizontal approaches. And we certainly think that we do need both and that one should be sort of looking forward and uh, pragmatic adapting to the situation in different countries to see to what extent can they be merged and how can they be merged, because both are needed. And um, we've seen that it um, might have been very difficult to reach the goals that you've just, or the achievements that you've just described, unless one had had the vertical approaches. But we also see that it may have side effects, <laughs> to call it that, where you get parallel systems, people not working together, it doesn't support the development of a national uh, healthcare system or health system in the countries. So that is an ongoing job and there's no easy solution to it, no, no, not a single solution. I also uh, would like, before moving into our collaboration with the different countries on, on building national public or developing national public health mm -hmm. functions and institutions, to just mm, say that I strongly support your arguments for uh, saying that COVAX and the other mechanisms for getting vaccines or the COVID vaccines out to uh, poor countries and, and <coughs> middle-income countries has been a success. It doesn't mean that it's been f completely fair or that one has achieved the goals that one should be able to achieve, but it means that compared to everything that has happened before, historically, it's an incredible achievement. But if we go on speaking about it as a failure, how mm. can we possibly then explain uh, what the good things have been and what the, what the remaining Burning issues stuff, yeah. are? So I, I think we, we really have to think about how we speak about what's happened there. The um, uh, Norwegian Institute of Public Health has been involved uh, in more formal collaborations with countries, you mentioned most of them, Moldova, Malawi, uh, Ghana <laughs> and Palestine, uh, on developing public health uh, institutions and public mm. health functions. And we've done that in two ways. Uh, those uh, countries have been selected based on Norwegian uh, priorities, uh, and it's been funded as par part of health security development. So um, those aspects of it ha have been clear. But we've done it by twinning or partnering with those countries, but also identifying what our interests as a country not uh, as an institution, but as a country, are in developing those systems. And I think that at the moment, there's a, a big challenge in trying to, to work further on those issues because what we see is that we will need even stronger systems for distributing vaccines in the future, but we will certainly need much stronger systems on collaboration, on detecting and managing outbreaks at a much, much earlier stage so that they do not become pandemics. Mm. And, and that's where building those kinds of institutions is very important and has become even more important. Mm. So uh, in, in working with the countries that we have selected, there will um, be a, some achievements and some setbacks because those countries are in very diffi difficult situations, all of them. So it's a long-term long uh, partnership and we need to continue to work with them as partners because we need to achieve both what, what they need to be more resilient but also what we need to do together. Thank you, Camilla. 
Moving then to Ola, um, you work on a practical tool uh, that can hopefully help us uh, move on in this uh, it, tackling these uh, uh, complex challenges. DHIS2. I think a lot of people here are familiar uh, with that. It's uh, with a system. It's the world's largest health information system. It's free of charge and it is currently used in 76 countries. Um, uh, could you elaborate on how the system uh, contributes to health system strengthening and also how, how uh, is the implementation of the system different from other investments in, di uh, in the digital health space? Thank you. Thank you <coughs> and thanks for inviting us. Um, I think first of all a strong integrated health information system supporting ministries of health in monitoring the health uh, of its population across all these programs and intervention. It's a critical pillar of health system strengthening. Um, and DHIS since the beginning, back to the NORAD funded project in South Africa in the mid 90s, uh, has been designed to support this integrated approach to health information, uh, to support the management of the health system at large, and not to be a technology to support only one disease or one silo or one color of the skin, as was the case in, in South Africa and post-apartheid. Uh, so behind the DHI software, there's a bigger research and capacity building uh, program. The HISP approach has led to DHIS, that has led to DHIS being implemented as a national health information system in more than 70 countries, is first of all recognizing that it's more than technology, more than digital tools. Um, the software developers uh, at HISP, they've done a great job producing a platform that has lasted more than 20 years and is still more relevant than ever. Um, but um, they have not worked alone. The HISP approach has three core pillars, software development, capacity building and action research. And these are all equally important. Um, and they're important to us, not just at the University of Oslo and the HISP Center, but the whole HISP network. Um, there are 17 HISP groups across Africa, Asia and Latin America that are offering training, advanced support and lifelong partnerships to ministries of health. Um, and beyond that network of core partners, there's a thriving online community of practice with thousands of users and experts, all types of stakeholders that together build a space for experience sharing, innovation and peer-to-peer -peer support. So the DHS2 platform has been designed to be flexible and configurable and allow users to configure the content without the need for a programmer. And we also invested a lot of time in providing good documentation, guidance and training material to make it a low barrier to get started with the basics. And furthermore, the open source platform allow countries that have programming capacity to also develop extensions and apps on top of the platform to be able to tailor to specific country needs. Um, and the HISP groups support ministries of health in building in-house capacity, their own core DHS2 teams that can maintain the system over time and adapt to new and emerging needs. Um, HISP groups also play a critical role in communicating then the feedback from the ministries back to the developers in Oslo that then come together compile a roadmap for DHS2 platform that uh, responds to the needs of the community, the countries that are using the platform. And the Action Research Program has over the last 25 years continuously worked with countries to strengthen health information systems through direct engagement in implementation and also uh, solving problems together with the users. More than 70 PhDs from the Global South have graduated through this program and the results from the research is continuously feeding into the software development and capacity building program. So all these activities contribute to building local ownership and human capacity within the governments, a strong foundation for achieving sustainable health information systems, critical component of health system strengthening. Mm. Thank you. And Ola, could I also ask you, I know you had, you had a very rapid scale up uh, during the pandemic response as well. And could you share uh, a, one or two examples mm. briefly on how uh, countries were able to adapt their existing systems to scale up um, the health surveillance during, and you know, what are the success criteria that mm. we should build on uh, in the years to come? Yeah. No, we saw that many countries with uh, existing DHI systems in place were able to react quite quickly to the pandemic. Um, 
and respond to the data needs, uh, first for the disease surveillance, but also later for the vaccination. So altogether around 45 countries scale up their COVID solutions on DHIS2. So the reason for this rapid response is very much related to the HISP approach I just described. Having existing capacity in the country, local ownership of the system, opportunities to flexibly configure and innovate on the platform, and a strong network of experts available to support locally, all proved very critical for the pandemic response. So all these factors contributed to great innovations happening in countries and through the established community of practice and culture for sharing innovations, these COVID-specific solutions spread quickly to the new countries, all struggling with very similar problems. So coming into the pandemic, we had benefited from many years of work with partners like Gavi and WHO and CDC to strengthen the C surveillance mm -hmm. and vaccination on the DHIS platform. Many countries had already scaled up the C surveillance and vaccination programs within their integrated HIS on the DHIS2 platform. Um, so there, of course, there are many great stories from the from the pandemic, how the country responded, but, uh, and you can read them all on the website. I'll mention a few. Sri Lanka, uh, with a local HISP group, they led the way and already by the end of January 2020, they had configured a port of entry module in their national DHS2 to monitor travelers coming from at-risk countries. And throughout the pandemic, Sri Lanka kept innovating and responding to data needs and developed support for contact tracing analytics, ICU bed availability monitoring, vaccination registry for the whole population, mm -hmm. and also integrated with the population registry and immigration services. And this work was made possible by the fact that DHIS was already a scaled up system, mature system in Sri Lanka. The Ministry of Health, they had many years of experience with the platform, and they had a well-established collaboration with the local HISP group for advanced support and capacity building. And this group, again, was a very active member of the global community uh, around DHS2. Uh, Rwanda is another great example how the government leveraged existing systems and capacity. So in 2020, Rwanda had already seven years of experience with uh, case-based surveillance systems on the DHS2 platform. And then the local HISP group worked with the ministry, quickly adapting these systems to the, the new COVID needs. So, and Rwanda implemented a complete paperless approach to COVID testing using Android devices at all the test sites. They integrated with the national lab to uh, speed up the response time for test results and set up uh, a web portal where the public could log in and get test results uh, online. Mm. So if you travel to, to Kigali, it's still operational. You go through a testing protocol and you get entry into the system at the airport uh, still. Mm. Thank yeah. Okay, thank you, Ola. Th these are really amazing, I think, uh, developments that are, that are are happening and really um, uh, reached scale during the pandemic. So, uh, Seth you and Ola mentioned already that you have been working closely with, uh, with the University of Oslo on this as well. Um, how can we continue to scale uh, and, and, um, uh, and also make sure that uh, these tools do strengthen the health systems at the national level. Uh, and what data are we missing at this point? So first of all, and I, I think Camilla made the point, um, you need both systems and we also need the diagonal. And this is really important. And I think, you know, DHIS2 is an example of this. So it is a, it is a system that was set up you know, you can call that, you know, a vertical. But what we did is we said, okay, we need to make sure that if we're going to have immunization information, it needs to be part of the national system. And so in 40 countries, we supported a module to bring immunization into the system, and then it's adapted for COVID. So it's, it's really about doing both things. And this is how you ultimately build a system that can meet the individual needs, but is is, is brought across mm -hmm. things. So I think in a sense, it's, it's, it's been very remarkable, both us and the Global Fund have you know, been supporting this because we see the power of it. Now, mm -hmm. you know, where are we going? When I, when I give public talks, sometimes I put in one of my favorite slides, which is the slide of a very, um, you know, very uh, detail-oriented Indian bureaucrat. And he's sitting there you know, with a book and there are books piled up behind him and mm -hmm. he's writing all the information down by hand. And he has two cell phones sitting on the table and he's not using those. And 
I think the next generation issues that are, you're now seeing now is going to be how we make sure every health worker, even at the lowest level, is fully empowered by using that data, having information both to help them when they come across cases where they don't know how to do that, mm -hmm. but also how they can get help and refer and do those activities. So it's going to be the integration with the national system down to the local system. And, and once we have that, it'll change things dramatically. So, you know, what we've seen over time has been digital reducing stockouts, increasing the efficiency of use of finance, making sure last mile is met, making sure that lower level health workers have the capacity to deal with more complex issues in local languages, you know, uh, materials for mothers and parents to be able to have knowledge on, on, on what they have to do. These are the exciting places we're going in the future that will help transform not just the health system, but the delivery of health and prevention through it, which is what's, what's absolutely mm. critical. Mm. Great. Thank you, Seth. Uh, we w I will actually soon open up uh, for some questions uh, from the audience, uh, but I will just let Camilla and Annette, do you have any sort of, you know, last very brief comments before we move to the questions on, on you know, what needs to be prioritized in the time to come? Camilla and then Annette. I, I think it's on. Well, there are, <coughs> okay. There are a few things that need to be prioritized. Is it on? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, I'll follow up on the discussion that we've just had because I think that uh, using or sharing the information systems is a very efficient way of integrating the vertical and the <laughs> horizontal approaches. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and the examples that you just gave and the ones you gave, they show that that is a good way of doing it. It's not the only one, of course. You need governance and you need the will to do it, and etc. But, but uh, for example, I, I, I got this example from, from the people at the Institute uh, telling uh, me about how um, the um, uh, system in Malawi doesn't work because there are three different people collecting the same data. And uh, if you want them to do that more efficiently, they certainly have to share data mm -hmm. and they have to access each other's data and they have to do it together. Uh, so by using a, a shared information system, that's one way of working mm. towards that goal. Mm. But lots of other... Lots of other things. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Annette, lots of other challenges. What do we need to... I think it's on. I think it's on. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm not going to... Uh, um, uh, give you the answer to that, but I just <laughs> thank you so much. And it's been really very interesting to listen to. And I think in many ways we are talking about now we evaluate what's the next step. And I, I think as the dust is beginning to settle a little bit after COVID, I mean, at least we, we here, I have the luxury of thinking it's over at least. I think there are three things I'd like to highlight. And first of all, as we mentioned, the lack of established mechanisms for efficient global cooperation. That led to delayed response, a lot of ad hoc initiatives and more fragmented responsibility and efforts. And I'd like to underline that there were many states that did an enormous effort. And Norway, I would certainly highlight, at the time we had a political leadership that was deeply committed, that made it a huge priority that Norway was going to be visibly supporting and doing efforts to support also the international community and poorer countries. So that's not where the failing was. <laughs> In my view, the failing was that the local, no, no, sorry, the global community of decision makers didn't come together. Mm. And that was partly because they didn't have somewhere to come together really at the time. Mm. So the effort was there and it was beginning. And I think to build on what we actually achieved through partnership at the time, that was important. So to strengthen that, mm. what, we, what we finally started to get together on and to, to, uh, to make sure that we have these mechanisms in place. And uh, you can count on always support for that. Second, I think that this uncertainty around what is actually happening, who is deciding, who's doing what, that was not very helpful. And I would uh, say that that fueled vaccine nationalism in a way because it was the only rational thing to do when you don't know what is happening you have to make sure that you secure your own population etc 
And a lot of countries had the ability to do so, but I mean, we, we know what position, <laughs> we can ask Camilla to tell us everything about this, I think. But there is something that goes together. And, and, and thirdly, it has been highlighted, and I'm so happy that it seems to be a real agreement on that, that the existing weaknesses in health systems around the globe were reinforced. It became so visible, I think, that we have not succeeded before people are actually vaccinated and that the national and local health systems, at, in some places, were the weakest link. And to have a focus on strengthening, realising that if we think that the best sort of strategy forward would be to prevent and then to prepare and then to have an efficient response, I think we need to have all these things coming mm. together. Mm. So that would be the message. Mm. And also like to add that in that partnership, it must be states taking responsibility. There must be important actors like Gavi stepping up and, and having sort of the muscle and the ability and also civil society and sort of other actors so that it is jointly owned and, and reinforced and implemented. Mm. Mm. Thank, okay. you. Thank you, Annette. So, Seth, just lo one last comment from you before we... Well, I, I, you know, it is interesting because we were called naive because countries have self-interest and they were like, you think countries aren't going to have self-interest? Of course they are. And, and that is exactly the point. Mm. This pandemic was severe, but we maybe will have a more severe pandemic. What if we have H5N1 with 30 or 40 or 50 percent mortality? I mean, so the issue is not that countries are going to protect their own citizens. The question is, how do we build systems to make sure that they don't only protect their citizens over time? What the original model, which people misunderstood, was let's try to get the high-risk populations vaccinated around the world. But of course, you, a political leader, says, I want my high-risk populations vaccinated. The question is whether you have to have every one of your lowest-risk populations vaccinated before anybody in the world gets their high-risk populations. And that's the, that's the change we have to have, but it also means building systems because you know, you may have political leaders, and there were many, I don't have to name them, <laughs> during that time who said, you know, the hell with the rest of the world. We're just going to support our country. So what you need then are other systems. That is distributive manufacturing so that we have more capacity to produce in different places and making sure that there are alternate systems. And of course, one of the hardest things is to make sure the trade system works and we don't have export bans and you know blockages of raw materials moving, which paralyzed everybody. It wasn't helpful mm. in doing that. So these are the lessons learned. And the critical thing for me is we have to make sure we you know, look at the good things, but also learn from the bad things with an honest conversation about what held us up so we can do better next time and there is going to be a next time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Seth. So, uh, yes, I will now open the floor to see if there are any question to, uh, questions to the panel. Uh, I'm sure there are. We have a few minutes, so I will have to ask people to be brief uh, and then we will have a little bit of time to to come back so uh, we have people with microphones uh, here in the room uh, yes please um, and could you just uh, say your name and and also your institution right. if you represent one thank, thank you very you. much my name is Katerini Storang I'm from the University of Oslo so um, of course Gavi has invested a lot over the years in health system strengthening but uh, as has been discussed in the literature and elsewhere, health system strengthening isn't just about addressing bottlenecks in service delivery. It's also about ensuring that, that uh, public health authorities have the ability to balance competing health concerns and to finance those sustainably and take public uh, or political accountability for those decisions. Now, I've heard Gavi speak a lot about country ownership, but when you look at the dedicated support that Gavi has given to health system strengthening through its grants, the majority of those are channeled through international partners and also country voices have been excluded from the reviews of the effects of those um, grants on country health systems. And similar concerns about power asymmetries between donors and recipients have been raised in relation to COVAX. And so I was just wondering if you could comment a little bit on how Gavi is addressing this issue which is, um, which is really uh, at the forefront of people's concerns at the moment about power asymmetries. Thank you. And then I think we will give it, I saw one more hand actually, and that's what we have time for. I'm so sorry <laughs> before we have to wrap it up. So, so, yeah. so uh, I, I just say that uh, 
this discussion has been with us from the start of Gavi. And uh, we have always been hunting for the diagonal approach that, uh, that uh, Seth mentioned, namely to get the results, but to then to provide the support in as flexible way as possible. And uh, the first experiment we did was that we paid countries for $20 for each additional child immunized, and then that money would just give to the, to the ministry or to the government, and then it could be used the way they wanted. Now, 40% about of the Norwegian health system is results based in that way. Uh, but as we know from Norway, uh, uh, then it's tempting to over-report. Over so that happened and we didn't have a system in place. So that experiment, it should have been uh, done by UNICEF and WHO at the country level should have actually been the, a certify, certifying the data. But when it's not your money, you tend to take light on such issues. So uh, it, it failed. So, but when you are an experimenter, you also uh, do uh, experiments that fail sometimes. Uh, but I think the diagonal approach, and we heard an example of that here, is very important um, to always look for that uh, type of approach. And I think, uh, for example, when you have a system in place for diagnosing one disease by bringing blood, as they do in Uganda, from newborns, to a laboratory for testing at HIV AIDS. Obviously, you can use that system to build in other mm. aspects as well. Mm. That's an example of diagonal approach. Mm. And I think uh, Seth has also mentioned now the question of Gavi going broad-based to reach the last child. Mm. So I, th I, think, uh, yes. I think one by being a little bit more granular than uh, <laughs> using the term health system, mm. you can actually then achieve to, to, uh, to uh, make these kind of diagonal approaches that are Thank will be very important. Thank you. Thank you. So I think comments and questions mainly to you, Seth. So I'll give you a few minutes to yeah. respond to that. So I, I, I think that the, the question is when, when Gavi started and you heard one experiment where the money was just given to the country, we also provided the health system's money directly to governments. And what happened was we ended up with a number of countries having misuses in their systems. And um, at the end of the day, what we heard from our donors was, yes, we have some risk appetite, but we also have a problem. If we start having misuse on the news all the time, we will, it'll be difficult to provide resources. So at the end, we had to create a system that allowed controls to be put in place. And that has been challenging because at the end, you know, the way the Gavi system works is you get some support when you're in your poorest state, but as you get wealthier, you pick up more and more of the cost until you eventually graduate. If, if you're not using country systems and countries financing to be able to do that, then you will not succeed. So we are constantly trying to move the support back to countries, but if there are misuse cases, then we have to continue the work because we have to make sure the systems are continued to be able to be built whilst we try to put in better and stronger systems. And the most interesting part of this has been working with national audit agencies and, 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 and um, the broader bodies, supreme you know, bodies in countries to get them more attuned to looking at the finances. And that's important because Right now, it's donor finance, and there's special sensitivity there. But you know, when it's your own money in the country, if it's being misused, particularly when you don't have a lot of that money, it is a tragedy because it's taking away from the system and other issues. So this is what we're trying to work on. And it's a, it's a very different, uh, difficult balance to be able to make it happen. But at the end, all of the 
the actual investments, our health systems, are driven by countries. They choose what they want. They put it forward. It goes through an independent review process. Of course, they f frame if there are challenges with that. But the process is to provide support for the countries, including on innovation. And I think this is a really important use of external finance, is to bring in the new tools, the new concepts, the new ways of working for countries to experiment, as Tori just talked about, um, uh, so that they can leapfrog over existing problems and technologies. Not everybody does it, but it's very powerful when it really happens. Mm, okay. Thank you, Seth, and, and thank you so much for, for joining us here in Oslo today. And best of luck with your the, the months that you have left in, in Gavi. And I think it's now time for us to say thank you to the panel. And uh, I will soon uh, give the word to Bård Vegard uh, Soliel, the Director General of NORAD, who will uh, share with us uh, some concluding remarks. But a big hand to the panel. Thank you. <laughs> We, we, I guess we can just take our seats when, yeah, thank you. Feel free, do that. <laughs> so uh, thank you uh, uh, to the panel for a really uh, interesting conversation uh, uh, on these big and complex issues. But allow me also a special thank you to, to Gavi as, as the long-standing partner you've been uh, for us. There, there's one number that I almost always use in speeches. Actually, last time was yesterday. Uh, and, and that's uh, the ha number of halving of child mortality from the turn of the century until now. Because in when, if you're going to just take one number to explain that the world isn't, you know, that it's not falling apart, that's the, not the main story. The main story is that the world is, is a success, that we're doing progress. It's that. Uh, and, and there's another uh, number you didn't use that, but that, that's uh, uh, the estimation you've done, um, you know, of future lives saved uh, by Gavi vaccinations, more than 16 million children, which is an amazing achievement. And you know, sometimes people say, you know, numbers, that's, you know, they, uh, people tend to say, you know, figures and numbers, that, that's something else in, in opposition to people. Well, I disagree. Numbers are important because they tell stories about real lives, real people. Uh, and in this case, uh, uh, real children. And these children, they live to tell these stories. Uh, and it's probably the, the most amazing achievement that, we, that we've done in international development uh, the last few decades. And also, maybe I'll, uh, I'll take the opportunity to, to, to just to stop a little bit at Norway's contribution to this, which is, of course, we know have been important, uh, and in two different ways. And of course, one of them is, as usual, money. Uh, uh, we, we've been, uh, we, we've funded uh, uh, Gavi and other partners uh, in this uh, period, actually. And I, as I usually do, <laughs> I looked at the numbers also here before, before I came here. And if you take the last 20 years, largely speaking, uh, global health has been the biggest thematic priority in Norwegian international development, uh, which goes to speak of how important it has been for Norway, and Gavi has been, the last few years, one of Norad's uh, biggest partners. But the other one is brain power, I think. Um, uh, and so a few na names have been mentioned, Tora, um, and there's this term, in, and the Norwegians will know it, Norgesven, right? Uh, the friend, friend of, a friend of Norway. It's a term we use about people who are not very famous in their home country, but they can become big in Norway, like Bonnie Tyler or Leonard Cohen, <laughs> classic examples. Well, Tora Gudal is, in a way, the opposite. Because no one knows who is in Norway. He's not famous at all. When I ask people, they say, May, uh, do you mean Björn Tore Godal? Uh, uh, but in international development, he's a celebrity. People will ask me, how's Tore? Uh, but they have no idea about this football player in Manchester City or other Norwegians. But they know about Tore Godal. Uh, but there are, of course, there are many others, former politicians, Gro Allen Brundtland, Jens Stoltenberg, Jonas Gahr Støre, Dag Finn, uh, Høybrotten. Uh, people in the civil service in, in, in the Minister of Sigrun Mögerdal or uh, uh, Annette Jonan or Rettingen or on Per Fife, Lene Lothe, and from other institutions. You saw some of them here, uh, Camilla and others, and also from the econ our academic institution. There's probably no uh, single field where an, the, a cluster of people in Norway has played an international role like that. Uh, so I think we should take uh, uh, pride in that. 
And allow me just to also a last comment on health systems. I'll go not go into the conversation here, which is good. I'll just leave behind at least the reasoning for us, and I think also the ministry, why, why the ministry has made this a, a big priority. And simply that the best crisis management is a good system. Uh, and I think we, it's, it's not only for health, but we learn it again. I mean, there's, there's a reason why we have a crisis plan in every uh, institution and why we train. There is a reason why we invest in security and defense, right? And there's a reason why we should invest in health systems. Because it's the best way of dealing also with a health crisis. And countries who dealt pretty well with the pandemic learned that. We built on, a good, on good institutions, good services, a good system. And we also learned from the pandemic that good, we have to build good national systems but we also, for some issues, we need good global systems. Because some challenges are truly global. Uh, and and uh, dealing with a pandemic, uh, 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 keeping, you know, uh, working with it, will be a truly, in essence, global issue. And it has also that to it that every country in the world has an interest in dealing with the pandemic. But no one has an interest in, on their own, spending the money. To. So global solutions as part of that. And that's also why we, when, when it comes to health priorities, we will do the more complex work of building systems because we think that's needed as the basis and also a, a good and important investment in the long term in international development. So again, thank you for, uh, for enlightening our conversation, for taking the time to be with us, all the panelists, uh, and a special thanks to Gavi for a long-standing cooperation. Thank you. <laughs>